So I, I like to call now uh, uh, Tobias Hogg. Okay, let me introduce you. Okay, so I mean, Tobias, I, I've known uh, Tobias since a few years because he was a, a, a PhD student at the Center for Quantum Technology in, in Singapore, where I also work, and we have a couple of papers um, uh, to, together. Okay, so now he has moved uh, to Imperial College London, and uh, to to today, tonight, depends on where you are on the planet. Okay, I mean, Tobias will talk about quantum transport with uh, with uh, cold atom. So, Tobias, the floor the floor is. Well, the All right, thank you very much, Christian, for the very kind introduction. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about as Christian very nicely put on quantum transport with cold atoms. Um, so this work is uh, my. Obviously, is a part of my PhD thesis. Uh, you can find the references of the corresponding papers below. Um, yeah, so the main idea, let me switch. Okay, so as the name suggests, what I'm interested in is basically the question, uh, what can you do with cold atoms? So as you're well aware, cold atoms are pretty much a gas of atoms that you cool down to low temperature, such that you get like a gas, which has a macroscopic occupation of the quantum grounds. So in the end, you have like a many body state, which is pretty much close to zero, close to ground state, and you have a macroscopic number of atoms of a matter wave that you that is ready for you to do, to do quantum physics. And what you can do with this, I, I would like to know about quantum transport using those, those atoms. So the idea that you take those atoms and you want to now study how they're flowing, how they're transported, and see how like the quantum effects like affect the transport and do this in like in a real fashion, unlike the, the transport car. This is just a car, by the way, but this is a real car. I want to do actual quantum physics. Okay, so to do that, uh, basically we have to somehow control the atoms. And as you just heard in my previous talk, um, Yes, nowadays there's a amazing techniques out there you can use to, to control atoms to a very high degree and extreme precision, as you just heard. Um, just to, to, to just to recap shortly, uh, you can trap atoms using light fields. So by tuning the laser frequency appropriately, the atoms will feel an effective type of force by the intensity of the laser field. And by shaping the light field appropriately, you can um, basically create an effective potential for the atoms to, to live in. And using this very nice device called digital micro device, which you just heard about, which you can program in quite a arbitrary fashion, you can generate images that um, that you can put onto these micro devices. You can control them, and you shine light on it, and then you can project a Taylor laser field onto your atoms. And in a recent experiment, uh, it was basically shown that you can see these this very nice experiment on the bottom right, where um, Halim Rubens and Dummer show that you can imprint the faces of Bose and Einstein as a laser field. This is the middle picture here. And when you now put in a bunch of cold atoms, uh, they will follow this image. And the atoms will, the atom atomic density, which is shown on the bottom right, follows exactly the faces of Bose and Einstein. So whatever is here, like in white, this is a high atomic density. And you can now basically control the atom density to a very precise degree. And this opens up, of course, the, now the possibility to make very a sophisticated experiment and to study transport in, in interesting in circuits. And, um, and this has been fundamental in studying, for example, many body physics, as you're all aware of. Uh, all aware. And you know, I want the idea is that you can now convert this concept and you can now study quantum transport. Um, so, basic approach for this quantum transport. Um, so, the as you heard in the, in the previous part with Tim Esslinger, the idea is that you want to stunt or study the directed motion of atoms or of, of particles in some way. Um, to give you a simplistic idea how I envision that is that you basically have a source where the atoms or the particles come from, then they propagate to some system into a drain. So you have motion from the left to the right. And what you have is like a directed motion, like a current. And the current that flows from the source to the system will be affected by the system properties. So depending on what is the internal structure of the system, what it consists of, like what is this, its potential, its particles and the action and so forth, depending on that, the current will change. So depending on what you have inside the system, its microscopic properties, let's say, the current will be large or small or in whatever way will be affected by it. So the current is a probe of the internal structure of the system. 
So the kernel allows you basically to read out the properties that are internal in the system. So you can understand um, what's going on inside without actually looking in, just by looking at the current that you observe. And this is not just some theory, but it's actually fundamental in what we basically live in today. So to give you an example, like in the terms of solid state physics and electronics, the semiconductor transistor was um, on other nowadays that I can talk to you right now via the internet, we need these semiconductor transistors in order to, to convert our video and speech and so forth. And in the end, this is, this is some kind of transport setup where you transport like electrons and you can control the transport by applying some voltage. And nowadays the system becomes so small, like on the scale of nanometers, that in order to make them better and better, you have to understand how are the electrons flowing in such a nanoscale system. And this is in the end, this quantum mechanics. So if you want to build better devices, we need to understand how is quantum transport working? How is like quantum matter transported to such devices? But this is also not, not only important from, let's say, from an economic point of view, but also from very fundamental questions can be studied using, using transport. So one question I, that is extremely interesting and we heard yesterday about Michael Berry is how, is the, how are particles that are transported interacting with an applied magnetic field? Uh, so you can think of this kind of setup where you have like a magnetic field that interacts with, with particles. So how is this interaction happening? So using transport, you can understand and study these kind of fundamental questions. So nowadays we have now, um, that's the fitting title of this conference, uh, we have now atomtronics. And now we can basically go beyond what people have in the past. They just, people in the past, they just studied, they, are the, they could study quantum drugs of it, so using solid state devices. But now we have now the power of, of cold atoms to, to study the transport with. And this opens up completely new possibilities. Um, because now we basically we can use the cold atoms as some kind of carrier of particles of matter. And we can use the chemical potential as some way of, of directing the transport. But with atoms now, we have now a far more higher degree of control over, over the system itself. So then, for example, with, uh, with atoms, we can now switch. We can have fermionic atoms, we can have bosonic atoms, and you can freely change between those two. Whereas with, let's say, so we have a very high degree of change in the kind of particles you want to study. You can tune the reactions from weak to strong reaction, attractive to repulsive and so forth. And as you know, also we can change the potential in a precise manner and study different configurations. And this can be now also in principle now, nowadays done in, in laboratories. And, and this has been done as, as you just heard that you can perform very interesting experiments where you study transport on, for example, the fermions, you can study the transport through small contacts. Uh, this has been like, very nicely done. You can study, as you just seen, the transport of bosons through um, to some contacts and see like the dynamics of the bosons and how they're sloshing around. So you can in this stu study these all these very interesting kind of topics. Um, so during my PhD, I was thinking, um, now we have these two electronics, can we even go beyond that? What else can we study? What kind of features and phenomena are we able now to study using um, using atomtronics that that could be considered and would be reveal something interesting and kind of new interesting physics? What can we do? And so what? So I'm not giving you basically a few uh, highlighting a few topics or things that that we showed that are extremely interesting. Uh, one thing I the first topic I want to talk about that we have studied is the so-called uh, Anaphom effect, which you all heard yesterday about. I'm just going to give a very short uh, recap of what it's about and in what context I'm going to use it. So uh, the idea is that you have some particles that go from the left and they, they are split up into two paths and they surround some, some kind of magnetic field and then you combine them and then you interfere the, these two paths. And what happens is now that depending on the applied magnetic field, you the upper path and lower path have a different phase. And this will affect the current that goes to such the this, this system. So when you, when you try to measure the current that appears at the end, you will see that it will, it will change depending on the applied magnetic field. And this is plotted on the right. So we plot the current against the applied magnetic flux. And what we first, of course, see is that the current has some kind of periodic motion. And the period is given by the so-called flux quantum phi zero, uh, which we, this graph is just set to one. 
And if you go to half the flux quantum, so we apply many field, which corresponds to half the flux quantum, you see that the current becomes minimal. And in an ideal case, it, it goes down to zero. So basically, the, the magnetic field has the effect that it will control the current. So we go, can go from large current to basically zero current and back, just by changing this applied magnetic field. And the reason is, of course, that we have this destructive interference. And if these two paths are destructive interference, they will effectively block the current, and there's no transport. And this is not just some theory, but has been observed in electronic rings or like in the 80s, uh, where exactly this effect has been observed, that you can control the current, the transport, just by applying a magnetic field. So the idea is now, can you convert this, these kind of concepts into cold atoms? Um, in fact, we, we model this topic from, um, by using the Bosa model. Uh, we devised a model how you can study now this, this, this concept of form transport in, in a cold atom setup. So to do that, uh, you can use the bose haber model, which is depicted on as a kind of sketch on the top right. So what you see is that we have some the black spots is supposed to be the lattice. So we create some kind of lattice potential that you, let's say, create with a laser. And the atoms will now, they like to go to the minima of the lattice. So the, the blue things, the blue spheres are supposed to be atoms. They will now like to congregate at the, at the bottom of this lattice wall. And the atoms now can tunnel from one lattice side to the next with some coupling constant. And when you have two atoms or more on the same side, they will repel each other. It's almost a factor U. And you can also change the depth of the lattice. And with this, you can control the local potential. And using this model, we can now engineer uh, uh, this, this Arnold Form effect in the following way. So we have, uh, this is shown here on the, on the left. So you can look first, you have the, what you call a source. Um, this is, we model this as a one-dimensional chain of, of lattice. So the red dots are supposed to be lattice sites and these uh, red um, lines, they're supposed to indicate the, the tunneling. So, so we have now a one-dimensional lattice, which we call source, where we place our atoms. Then we have a ring, a lattice ring, with an applied magnetic field, uh, artificial magnetic field, and we have the drain. And source and drain are coupled on opposite sides to the ring. Okay, so now we need to have this um, magnetic field here to get the Arnold-Ohm effect. Uh, of course, atoms are neutral, so you don't have a charge. So if you apply a magnetic field, you, they will not feel a Lorentz force. So by doing that, there won't, won't be a magnetic field. However, you can artificially induce by using a kind of synthetic magnetic field. So you can simulate the effect of a magnetic field by using some tricks. Um, there's many ways to do it. So one way is, for example, rotation. So if you rotate the system, then you can see that in a rotating frame, you get the uh, Coriolis force. And the Coriolis force has exactly the same form as a magnetic field. So it turns out that rotation can be, has, is a way to simulate the effect of a magnetic field onto the system. So we have now basically a way of introducing an artificial magnetic field on the system. So now we can now start, want to study transport. So we need to induce some motion. So we need to excite the system in some way. Um, there's many ways of, to do this, of course. Um, one way we study how to do this is the following way. Um, it's sketched on the bottom right here. So at, at time zero, uh, this is this t equals zero graph here on the, on the top. What you're plotting is the density and the potential in the source. So on this, on this left part of this, of this lead ring system. And what we do is we take the potential to be zero at most places, but at a few lattice sites, we decrease it a bit. And wherever the potential is now decreased, um, the atoms like to congregate there, right? Because the potential is lower and the atoms like to lower the energy. So therefore there's now a small density bump. So where the potential is lowered, the density of atoms will be increased. So you have like a small increase of atoms there. And if you now at t greater zero, we release this potential, we quench it, make it all zero. Then this bump here of density of atoms becomes unstable. And as a result, they will start propagating. And they were propagating both in the left and right side, left and right direction due to momentum conservation. Uh, we can just forget about the right side and just look at now the motion of the, this density to the right. And this is exactly what we need. We have now a directed motion to the right that goes from the source and over to the ring into the drain. So this is exactly what we wanted. We have now a way of inducing transport in the system. And we can now study this and use this to, to learn about uh, transport in such system. 
um, we do is the following way. We, we basically, we, we look, we, we sit ourselves in the drain and monitor the density there as a function of time. And this is, and by checking out how much density arrives in the, in the drain, we know about the transmission, how much, how much is the current that it has gone through the ring. If you now do this for fermionic atoms, so we take our atoms and we make them, we choose a fermionic species and we prepare them inside, inside the system and now study the, the, the transport. The result is shown on the bottom left. So let's look at the graph on the, on the top graph here, the top curves. Um, what we plot here in green and yellow is flux zero and flux one half. So the green one is no flux, so there's zero magnetic field, artificial magnetic field. What you see is that initially, it, what it plotted is the density amplitude of the incoming wave against time. And we see that after like, let's see time 30, we see now a bump arriving. So this is the density wave arriving in the, in the drain. So initially it's zero because the, the, the wave is still traveling. And once it reaches the drain, we see now this, this particular bump here that indicates, okay, now our density wave that we induced has arrived inside the drain. So for flux zero, we see, okay, there is transmission. We have some current. So we see there is some current flowing through the system. So now we make now a change. We, we set our flux to one half, half of flux quantum. So at this point now we have this destruct interference effect that we know from the Anna-Bohm effect. And as a result, the density is always staying zero. So meaning the, the density wave that we induced never managed to arrive in the drain. The reason is of course that the density wave went to the ring. However, it experienced destructive interference and the destructive interference blocked it from ever reaching the drain. So this is effect, exactly the effect of the Anna-Bohm effect we observe. It, it blocks the transmission and the current goes to zero. So this is what we see for fermions. This is the basically Anna-Bohm effect we observe for fermions. It will modulate the current in the system. Now we switch over to bosons. So we replace the atoms and make them bosonic. And what you observe now is this curve on the, on the right here. And we see the blue and the orange curve for zero flux and one half flux quantum, they're exactly the same. We always see this bump here. And in fact, it turns out any value of flux we chose, be it zero, one half, one quarter, one third, we always see exactly the same, the same curve. So that means is we always have transmission to the system. There's always current flowing through. And whatever value of flux we chose, we always see the same current. So it means for bosons, the current is independent of flux and therefore the Arnold-Bohm effect is absent. So bosonic atoms do not react to this artificial magnetic field at all. So this is quite surprising. So there's a fundamental difference between fermions and bosonic particles. And this result is actually found quite consistent for different transport settings. So when we went beyond density waves, we went to like strongly quenched systems where many atoms are flowing at the same time, we saw the same effect again, that the Arnold-Bohm effect was not observable for bosons. Um, the origin is not quite clear yet. Um, one thing one might conjecture is that the difference between fermions and bosons is that fermions are Fermi C, if boson forms uh, are BC, some kind of condensate with a coherent wave. And this coherent phase wave, um, may kind of shield the applied flux of the, of the, of the magnetic field and they somehow cancel each other out and, and, cancel, and, and effectively erase it such that we do not observe the Anna-Bohm effect in the end. Okay, so after this result, uh, I'm gonna switch over to a different topic. Um, namely, I'm gonna talk a bit about wave reflections. Um, this is an effect that is uh, known from interfaces in, sim in, super in between a normal metal and a superconductor. So in a normal metal, your charge carries are electrons, whereas in superconductor, it's Cooper pairs, so two electrons combined together. If you now look at transport from a normal to a superconductor, you observe that the incoming electron is converted into two Cooper pairs that travel onto the right. And the reflection that goes back is now a hole in order to preserve charge. So it turns out that Sending in one electron, you get two electrons that are transmitted and something of opposite charge that's going backwards. And the question we ask now, do we have similar phenomena that we can observe now with bosons? So if we place fermions of bosons, can we maybe observe some, some effect like that as well? And to study that, we look at now a Y-junction that we made of, uh, that we can make of cold atoms and filled with bosons. So the idea is that you use this similar setup as you've seen before, 
with the rings, but now we replace, um, so we again, we have the source, but instead we have now two drains and each of them are being one dimensional lattice chains and they're coupled together at the end. So this, the source, the last side of the source is coupled to the first lattice sides of the drain with some coupling constant K. So that one is very important to study the transport because um, depending on what you choose for K, uh, you can think of immediately that we get different dynamics because the K basically is the, the tunneling rate between source and drain. Um, so if you make, let's say we make now K very small, so the tunneling rate between source and drain is very low. That means they're barely coupled. And we can see this now if we study some transport. Um, to study this, let's have a look at the, this graph here and in particular the bottom curves. Um, what you see is basically the density wave against time. And you see two peaks. The first peak is the incoming wave that comes in. And the second peaks you see is the reflection that comes back. Okay, so if you make K small, so we have a very low tunneling rate, um, we see a positive reflection. So in this case, this is the green curve, we see some positive wave going back. And that's quite obvious what's happening here is because the coupling rate is so low, the source and drain are effectively decoupled. So an incoming density wave will just be back reflected. It's like hitting a wall, it can't go through. If you now increase K to a factor of one half, we see that the reflection is not gone. We see just a flat curve. So this is now the case of impedance matching. So the incoming density wave is perfectly transmitted to the other side and there's no reflection wall. And if you make K now even smaller, uh, bigger, and say to one, you observe something weird now. So if you look at the blue curve, you see that the, there is some kind of negative part now. So density is becoming negative that going back. So we get now a negative reflection of opposite, of opposite kind of density. And this very much mirrors the Andreev effect that I showed you earlier. And however, the, the value is a bit different. So um, if you calculate this system numerically, we find basically that the, that the transmission is four thirds of the incoming wave. So if you, if you send in a wave with amplitude one, the transmission is four thirds of the incoming wave. So more than the original send in and the reflection is minus one third. So, um, and this number is in fact, um, can be calculated using mean field. So if you make a mean field approximation of the system, we can derive these numbers analytically and they match very well what we find uh, using numerical studies, using DMG. So what we basically demonstrate now is um, uh, that you can observe some kind of under effect using bosonic atoms. Um, although the origin of this effect is a bit different. I mean, there's no Cooper pairs obviously in, in, in bosons, but instead it's more like related to a, a wave mechanical effect. Okay. Um, for this part, I'm just gonna basically just give a high level introduction for the next and last topic I want to talk about since uh, I don't have much time left. Um, so what we did is we used some kind of a method called topological pumping. What is that is basically you, you take a, uh, we took a, some kind of white junction system and we changed the potential of the system in time. So we changed the local potential in time in a particular way. And if you do it right, you can do something called topological pumping. So you use the topology features of the system to generate transport. So by driving, changing the potential in time, uh, in a periodic fashion, you can get a direct transport of matter. And use this and apply it to a wide junction. And if you do it in the right way, you can create entangled moon states. You can create highly entangled states uh, in space. And so in fact, what we get is we have like a kind of wide junction and we can create like a tangled states where either all the particles are on one side or on the other side. And we show basically that you can create these kind of states with uh, high fidelity and even for many particles. And these states are quite elusive um, because um, normally it's quite difficult, difficult to create an entanglement. But we show you can create, crazy, uh, create these states and you can use them for quantum enhanced sensing. Um, I'm just gonna cut short this. If you want to know more about this, just uh, you can just ask me or write me an email or, or whatever. So I'm happy to talk more about this. Okay, then just let me give an outlook on what, what's more to this. Um, so one thing I, I'm very excited about is, is using machine learning for, for, for transport and for code items in general. So what we recently showed in a, in a paper uh, is that you can use neural networks. So you take a neural network 
Um, and what recently you, you've probably heard about is that these are quite powerful tools to, 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 um, to, to uh, learn things. So for example, like um, Google has shown you can basically beat the, the world champion in the board game Go using uh, reinforcement, using neural networks. And there's a method called deep reinforcement learning that takes these neural networks and uses them, uses them to, to learn about the system and to learn how to control it. So we applied this to, um, to autonomously learn um, how to create currents, persistent currents. So we took the neural network and put it in charge of a model system, like kind of a ring system, and we basically gave the neural network control over the local potential. So it could change the local potential in time of the system. And then basically we let it play around and told them, please create some kind of persistent current by driving this, this system in time. And basically by playing around and it, it learns over time. So it managed to improve itself just without any human intervention, just by, by learning by doing. And in the end, we basically we would feed it like data, which were actually observables. You can measure in the lab in principle. And it managed to create uh, different kinds of persistent currents. Uh, we even managed to create like very strange kinds of persistent currents, which are consisting of um, three different types of entangled phase winding. So it's a, it's a very weird state, which people normally don't consider and don't know how to create. Uh, but if you just tell this, this neural network to do it, it will just create it. So it, it can run things which are very counterintuitive and uh, people normally wouldn't consider. So this is a very powerful tool you can think about to, to engineer transport. So you could like think about like using this kind of uh, setup to, to optimize your quantum circuits, to engineer the great kind of potentials you want to have, certain driving protocols. And it, since it's doing automatically, autonomously, you don't need to humans to, to supervise it. So you can just have it work in the background and you don't have, it will just do it for you and you don't have to supervise it. So you can basically delegate tasks that, you, you, that are too difficult for humans or that you simply, you don't want to bother doing yourself because it will take too much time. Okay, um, and finally, I just got to shortly mention there's, uh, if you, you can also go beyond what I studied, talking about now and study quantum transport in different kinds of platforms nowadays. Um, so one thing that's very exciting is I'm using going beyond single boson fermions, as I talked about, and take multi-species systems. So there's different types of bosons or fermions in the system and study how, what they're doing. So one thing, um, we started recently, for example, like SUN fermions and how they you can create a current with SUN fermions. So this is a um, there's a poster session by my collaborator Wayne. Um, he's giving a poster session, I think, this week or next week, on this on this topic of SUN fermions. So if you want to know more about this stuff, um, you should ask him. And finally, also there's been done so nowadays with Wittberg attempt superconducting circuits and different types of um, new, new things in, in quantum technology. And one thing I just wanna um, also mentioned is that recently what came up is something called noisy intermediate scale quantum computers for short NISC. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to use the quantum computers that are available right now built by IBM, Google, Honeywell and so forth and you're trying to put them to use. So these quantum computers that are available right now they're not very good. I mean they're good but they're not perfect quantum computers yet. They make they lack like fault tolerance. However they're still um, controllable quantum systems and, and, and they show very nice properties. Um, you can't treat them like a, as a real quantum computer, but you can design quantum algorithms tailored to these kind of currently available quantum computers and put them to use. And nowadays you have control over 50 plus qubits. So it's large systems, which are sometimes beyond what you can simulate on a classic computer. And this is a huge field now. So we re we've, re we've recently written a review on this, on this topic, um, which uh, if you want to know about it, it, you should check it out. And we also shown that um, you can now use the system to simulate quantum dynamics. So in principle, you could now use them to simulate the transport of matter or some, some dynamics of quantum systems, of many body quantum systems using these devices. And recently we've designed some new algorithms that you can use on these, on these systems to, to simulate dynamics. And we also shown how to avoid some pesky problems like the Baron plateau problem for, for quantum dynamic problems. Um, yeah, so with this, uh, I think, uh, I think you, uh, I, I, I talked about what I want to say, and I hope I gave you some nice outlook. Uh, finally, okay. these are the key points oh, yes. and the and the references if you want to read. And with this, I uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, I think you still have three minutes left. If you want oh. to a topic that you 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 skipped, you want to to talk a little bit about, you can. 
Uh, no, I think I'm done. So maybe you can have more questions if you want any. I, if someone wants to okay. know more about the stuff I skipped, you can just ask me. I'm happy to talk about this some more if you want to. Okay, okay. So then, uh, so then uh, there is a, a question from a panelist member. So Kevin Wright. Okay, maybe you you can uh, yes ask your question and uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Yes, device. Uh, so I'm curious, as someone who's uh, interested in looking at some of these kinds of things, uh, what you can tell me about uh, being an experimental realist, what mm -hmm. this is going to look like in a more uh, physical scenario where it's not uh, a lattice situation, but is more, I mean, you're, you're, you're tuning the tunnelings mm -hmm. on a site to site basis here, you know, you have single junction between lattice points. If one did this with something that was more continuous, mm -hmm. given real uh, Hmm. resolution limits, et cetera, at, at what point does one start to see these effects show up? I mean, you, I, I, can you say? Sure, sure. I mean, so these are like a, a lattice of consisting of 50 plus um, lattice sites. So at this point, it's it's quite long. So at this point, uh, it, it becomes pretty much like a continuous system. Uh, I guess what so I'm concerned about is the hmm. sharpness of that connection between the various ensembles or going back to your Herna of Bohm, hmm. uh, you know, the the you know, these junction points, if mm. that's a, if there are more modes available there, <laughs> oh, it, how, how, how does that affect things? If, if this is a bulk uh, Fermi gas uh, mm. sitting there and not a lattice. If you get down to quasi mm. 1D, for example, and mm. but, but continuous and not lattice, uh, can you comment at all on if that's enough to see some of these things? Yeah, I think it should be relatively continuous. So um, I think if you make it continuous in that limit, uh, of course, you would have to avoid that there's some sudden potential shifts um, that will disrupt like the, um, um, the system. So you, it should be reasonably smooth, I guess. Um, I think maybe, but you can also go on a, on a lattice level and try to create individual lattice sites. Um, I think nowadays you can create Lattice system, and of course, you have to some, make some kind of fine tuning that you get the, the consistent couplings. Um, but yeah, in the end, it, it's uh, I think it's um, one has to try out how well it works in, in practice. Uh, one thing I can say is that, uh, for example, in the case of the atomic wide junction I talked about, uh, yes. we actually we studied um, in this case the what happens if you go beyond one D. So we actually looked into or the system being a, like a lattice system or a perfect one dimension line, but like having a more extended system. Higher bands. Yeah, we just oh. said, just modeled using a, um, like a bit more two dimensional systems, so cross Pesky and stuff like that. And you saw, you can also see the, the drift reflection there. So they still appear, even if the system is two dimensional and like the, the junctions are not perfect, but like kind of a two dimensional kind of object. So at least for this system, you can see it. So um, I think these effects are, are more robust because on a form effect as well is, is, is a function only of the, of the flux. So if the, even the system is not perfectly 1D, even 2D, I mean, in the end, what matters is um, what is your total phase difference that you acquire. So it does not have to be perfect to, to observe it. I don't want to monopolize the discussion, but I have quite a few questions. So. <laughs> Pause and let if anyone else who wants to talk talk first. Otherwise, I'll continue. Luigi, Luigi then. Yeah, I would say a couple of comments. So first of all, I completely agree with uh, uh, Tobias, of course, uh, on uh, the possible, uh, say, two-dimensional correction to the system. Actually, this was pointed out by Michael Berry yesterday. So it's a very strong thing. I mean, it's a, just a single val val valueness of the wave function that actually make the Arno Bohm effect, right? So I think you observe also in uh, in uh, full respect to observe also for say toroid or just uh, for, for 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 larger system. And then on the continuous limit, I think uh, origin say that there are uh, um, explicit calculation in the continuous limit. By I think it's uh, Demler and Demler, yeah. uh, Tukuna, Tukuna. Oshik Oshikawa. I think Oshikawa, these yeah. people. I think they use so they were in the strictly one D regime, and they observe uh, uh, in a, in a, say in their setup uh, the same effect. So I think it's not question of the continuous limit. 
it's a and is not there. So, uh, to uh, Tobias, maybe you can answer and look at the, the, the question and answer chat oh, yeah, box. Yeah, and there are all. four questions. Okay, so maybe you can. Uh... Wait, wait, didn't look at all of them. Okay. Uh, maybe I just start from the, from the top. Yes. What is the order of magnitude of times involved in the experiment of quantum answer with code identity that I mentioned? What are the longest possible times? Um, as you can see, of course, um, I put everything in terms of, of J. So, J is the coupling rate, um, I think. Uh, the experimenters may correct me wrong, it's, but it's maybe on the order of kilohertz, I guess, so hundreds of hertz. So, for example, in this particular experiment, you see that the, the, um, the density wave arises at around 30. So, that would be then um, basically you have to multiply this now with the, let's say, one kilohertz or 100 hertz. So, that puts it in the range of seconds, second. one, sec one second, millis hundreds, millisecond, one second. I mean, it depends on your particular system. Um, uh, it depends also a bit on the system size, so I choose some particular system size, but I think that's the order of um, what you would expect. Maybe you can read aloud the, the question. Also. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll try to clear. And on, on the wave reflection, so this is asked by Tsoi, what is the physical meaning of negative density? Ah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Very good point. Um, yeah, so correct. This is a deviation of the, so we have a density background, so everything is filled with atoms. I think we've chosen a half billion. So on average, on ideal data side, there's half an atom. So either there's an atom or there's no atom with 50% chance. And now we measure the expectation value of the density, and we observe that there is now some deviation. So we see a bit more atoms or a bit less atoms. So in this case, it means negative density means there is a bit less atoms that is going backwards. So it's like a negative density wave. And yeah, so it's basically from subtractive in the background. How robust are the results you get of the neural net sensitivity to variations in the applied potentials? Oh, this is a very nice question. Yeah, we studied that actually. Um, go back one sec. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when you basically drive and when you put the neural network in charge, uh, we actually we didn't uh, put any noise on it. Uh, but actually, neural networks are well known to be robust noise. So you can train even with noise present, uh, they can still react to that. Uh, but we didn't particularly check that. But what we did is actually we, we trained the system without noise. And then afterwards, we, we took the solution it found and put noise on top of it. And it still worked. So there was only a very minor degree in change of the, of the performance. So it seemed the, the results that the neural network found or, you know, were quite were relatively robust against effects of noise. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, yes, I think the last question is in fact the same as the, the first one. Okay, so, okay. The, so about the negativity. So I, I think yeah, we still that. have time for one question. Maybe uh, Robin, uh, right. You 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 wanted to to ask a question. Maybe we you, we can get one more. Uh, maybe a quick clarification uh, with actually what was just discussed with that negative reflection. You're mm. plotting in that plot the expectation value for a single site. Yes. Uh, yeah. No. So it's a it's an average. So I take like I think ten or twenty. Maybe 10 letter okay. sites and average the result over them. So I guess I was just trying to understand how is mm -hmm. uh, conservation of charge working out there in this in the system in this model? If there's if there's got a, a density mm -hmm. depression somewhere, charge is conserved to where they go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, correct. So the charge is conserved. Very good point. Um, so as I observed, I write here that for this um, K equal one case, the transmission is four third. So meaning there is so you send a density wave, let's say amplitude one. Then four third of that is transmitted, okay. and minus one third is reflected. So this is a selection of sites that is just before the the junction, and some of this going through. You're not plotting that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just plotting uh, the reflection here, and the, the upper graph is showing the transmission. You see, the transmission is a bit larger than mm -hmm. than in the other cases. So yeah. we have more going through, and oh, uh, okay, now I'm understanding the plot. And okay. they are canceling out exactly. So the charge is completely conserved. It's just that somehow we get more transmission and negative reflection. I think I misunderstood the plot. Now I've got it. Thank you. Um, I, I see. Gerard? Gerard? Yep. Thank you very much. So, so uh, just, just to clarify, because I had the same issues as just been discussed. So density means actually excess density. So you yeah. say density zero is like the average. And then you have excess density, which can, of course, be smaller and lower. And, mm. and, a, and a question related to that is the 
the minus uh, 0 0.332, is this the maximum you get in this back reflection? Is, or is, is this just the, the value you get for k equal to one? Or is there the possibility to tune this? Um, yeah, we checked. So if you increase k beyond one, actually you find always minus one third. So it seems to be the limit. So if you take even more, uh, it will always stay at minus one third. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can tune in some way. So you can, for example, um, you can add more, more junctions. So let's say you take one source and three drains or four drains or five drains and so on. And the reflection increases. Mm -hmm. um, I calculated the formula. I, I don't really remember it, but I think it goes up to minus two maybe maximally. So I think the more junction you have, um, the higher the value gets, if I remember correctly. So this is like a Fabry Perot parameter where you can where you can increase the the transmission and the reflection by having additional mirrors or additional reflection. yeah yeah it's that like, yeah you increase some like an amplification in some way. That was the other thing I was going to ask is I mean there are Andrea interferometers used in superconducting circuits and wondering about setting up something like that as well. If this works, then that could work too. Yeah, correctly. Yeah, yeah, it's some way of amplification, but uh, yeah, take the density from the from the background. I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you.